2-0 Argentina. And I don't know, I mean, when you look at this match, it was the reigning champ, the undisputed champ, no doubt about it, facing a long shot. And the long shot came out, and man, they wanted to hit the champ with their best shot coming out. And they ran out of gas. Canada did everything. And look, Canada, and I'll start out with Canada first, because what a story they've been. What an amazing story. And, and, and man, they made me look good. <laughs> they made me look good. Uh, maybe a, a little overdue, but still, they made me look good. Uh, competitive. A team that's fiery and, and they needed fiery, but a different type of fiery that John Herdman could not offer them. And Jesse Marsh, just ring to finger, kind of match made in heaven type of situation that you end up finding with him and the team because he understands them quickly and they understand him just as quickly, maybe quicker. Uh, they were the ones that dared a little bit more. They did the difficult work compared to the U.S., compared to Canada. They went and went to uh, play the Dutch. They went to their backyard. They went to play the French. They went and they went to go play the French, I should say. They went to go play the French. They did their work. They did their road work and they did the hard work and it paid dividends. Now, for them to get to this stage, great. Uh, and you applaud them and you applaud what they've been able to do. And, and, and it's something that needs to be commended because that's what they deserve. And this is part of the ongoing process. It didn't end when they were eliminated in, in the World Cup in 2022. It kept on going despite the new leader being in charge now. And it's exciting to see because right now, if you look at it going towards the future, the only team that shows any type of hope in terms of CONCACAF is Canada. Is Canada. But today they just had, I mean... There's no way they could match the pedigree of Argentina. They just could not. They, they, they did not have that. Could they have that going into the future? Maybe. Maybe. Just maybe. But uh, I, I think if, if I just talk about pedigree alone, then, then maybe I end up losing the essence of what I'm trying to say about Canada and, and the work that they've been able to do and where they were to where they are. And what they've done with what they have, not just from a human standpoint or footballing standpoint but from an economic standpoint because they're way behind the ball when it comes to the u.s and, and mexico the hundreds of millions that mexico have the hundreds of millions that the u.s have canada doesn't have so what they've been able to my this time last year they didn't know what was going to happen i mean they go into the fifa international dates not knowing if they're going to have matches how they were going to call players up so so let, let's let's call things the way they are for me to, to stay stuck on a result today would be ridiculous. But to, for me to see today's result and go back and see where they were six, seven, eight, nine, ten months ago, man, that is to be applauded. They have done such great work and the players have to be commended. The coaching staff has to be commended and the leadership has to be commended and also demanded upon to grow and help the investment grow in terms of the game in Canada. Schafferberg, Afonso Davies, the two players that, that most of the, they end up being the catalyst offensively weren't it, but also Argentina understood reason why Gonzalo Montiel ends up playing. I think it's the first time since 2020, the beginning of 2022, <coughs> beginning of 2022, ladies and gentlemen, or somewhere in the middle of 2022, the last time since Montiel, Julian Alvarez, and Enzo Fernandez started a match together. This was when they were at River. They hadn't played together as starters in over two years, almost two years now. And, and they did the job. Each and every one of them did. Enzo Fernandez played very well in the middle. Julian Alvarez also had a sensational game and, and again, making history once again is that player that ends up making those big goals and big games in Champions League semis, in, in World Cup semis, now in Copa America semis, on and on and on. One of the underrated players in world football, in my opinion. 
but it, it, it's kind of difficult when, of course, Pep Guardiola doesn't give you minutes. So we shall see what ends up happening with him. Again, I, I mentioned Montiel and the work he did, and, and that kind of staggered. And, and the ultimate, and remember what I said in the previous video, you got to check it out, was depending on who's playing for, for Argentina, the purpose is to be able to, to make sure that the fullbacks are keeping in mind their backs not going forward. And, and they did that to an extent. Keep in mind, Canada came out, I think it was, and it, these aren't my words, these were Jesse Marsh's words. After the 18th minute, he saw that his team ran out of gas. The intensity was high, and they were going after Argentina. Don't get me wrong. They did go after Argentina for 18 minutes, but after that, Argentina understood. They, they, they said, okay, let's weather this. Let's see what has been happening. So they stopped. Okay, fine. Boom. Things stopped. Argentina started take over slowly, but surely, boom, 1-0 player that many people were talking about yeah, on social media. Ah, Rodrigo de Paul. Rodrigo de Paul is the best number eight in the world right now. Or if not, he's one of them. De Paul is, is just sensational. With, and as De Paul goes, sounds like a soap opera. As De Paul goes, so does Argentina. People can talk about Messi, and it's true. They have validity to that. You can talk about Julian Alvarez or Di Maria or whoever else, but the make the, the the battery that makes everything run in the middle is Rodrigo De Paul. De Paul's not working, Argentina's not. He didn't have a very good game against Ecuador. You start looking at the games that he plays and how he plays, see how Argentina plays, and you start to make the connection, the correlation. That ends up being one of the key moments for an Argentine side that, you know, I mean, first of all, it was very innocent on Canada because De Paul ends up finding a bit of space in the middle of the pitch where not only does he get the ball, he has the ability to turn around, look towards goal, send the ball right into Julian Alvarez, 1-0. So it's that. It's him fighting for balls. It's him associating. It's him distributing. It's him moving, getting the ball out of pressure areas, decompressing certain situations and freeing the ball over. People were looking a lot at statistics. Oh, because Canada... No. Canada, Canada after the 18th minute, really didn't have anything in the game. There are very few opportunities. Very few. Very few. Very few. Very few. And it was Argentina doing their job. Again, they're come, it was their best match. I'm not saying it was a great match, but it was a, their best match in this competition based on their previous performances. But in their previous performances, they've done good enough. A six. Six and a half at most. This was about a six and a half seven. But they knew that in their end of the bracket, a six and a half, seven was going to be good enough. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Canada really didn't do too much after that. So Argentina may, basically were able to control the match. They were able to regulate. They were able to understand. They weren't going to try and outrun Canada. Yeah, there were moments that they dropped back and they had counterattacking opportunities because the onus was on Canada to go forward and attack. So, okay, we'll drop back. The spaces were there. The counterattacks were there. Yeah, a lot of times they didn't cash in on them. There, That's true. But the threat was there. And Canada didn't shoot as much. I think there was, the first shot on target was something along the 89th minute of play. And Dibu Martinez made the, save, you know, the kick save that ended up popping right up and right to him. That was it. There were a couple of moments. Yeah, ball goes wide. Yeah. And that, at that point, Argentina kind of switched off for a minute or two. But there was really nothing else that they could do. I mean, there's really nothing else that Canada could do. Argentina were much better. Did they absolutely mop the floor with them? No. Did they regulate the match? Yes, they absolutely did. Of course, the Messi goal ends up just being, you know, shot by Enzo, Pe Enzo, Pérez. Enzo Fernandez, that Messi's right there being able to... Do. Now, if, if Enzo Fernandez, and I think Sergio Goicochea had mentioned it, if, if Messi doesn't touch that ball, it's a save by Cripo. So Messi just redirects it enough to get past Cripple, make it 2-0. He was onside because if it wasn't Bombito, I think it was Cornelius that kept him on by a lot. So that ends up being the, the goal that basically seals the deal for Argentina. Good match. Not great. They haven't needed great, but they're going to need great on Sunday. Because the winner of Uruguay and Colombia ends up demanding that. 
regardless of who they play, okay? Of course, I have a personal bit of nerves myself. Good nerves, but nerves nonetheless. Knowing that the demand is going to be there. The demand is going to be ever-present. That there is going to be a um, certain, I don't know, intensity that is going to have to be matched by Argentina at a certain stage. Because now, the intensity's been here, it's going to be up here. Maybe up here. Because Colombia offers that. Because Uruguay offers that. Because that's the way they're going to play them. Now is the moment we're going to see how Argentina ends up playing. Now, if they win or lose, I don't think their legacy is ruined too much. Yeah, well, we got to a final. That's great. We still won the World Cup. We've already won a Copa America. We're good. You know, Messi's legacy is not going to be tarnished. Although... This might be the end, the end of the road for Argentina's current, current situation. So Sunday might be a turning point in the national team's history. But they're going to have a very difficult final. Their most difficult match by far, by very far, in this competition. Okay, we'll preview Colombia and Uruguay tomorrow. But this is going to be a huge test for Argentina, no doubt about it. And I put on social media the, the amazing runs that these three teams... Argentina, I think, have only lost two of their last 61. Colombia have gone unbeaten in their last 27. And Uruguay have only lost four of their last 25. So, it's going to be... A, I, I, and I hope, I really do, that whoever gets there, that it's an amazing final. Now, if it's Colombia, I hope they win. <laughs> that's a different story. Um, that, that's, that's where we end up seeing... How fit this Argentina? Because this Argentina side doesn't look fit. Now, they they don't look as fit as they did in the World Cup. Obviously, the calendar has a lot to do with that. But there's a lot of other factors that are going to be present in this in this match on Sunday, regardless of who it is. And it's going to be quite exciting to see that. So, we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. We'll be analyzing, and of course, after Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, will be Copa America, Copa America, history of Copa America, a lot of talk. Topics and a lot of stories and a lot of things that are Copa America related as, of course, this tournament comes to an end here in South Florida on Sunday. Folks, it's been good. Talk to you soon. Make sure you share. Make sure you, you start to spread the word. Make sure you do your duty in terms of leaving comments, giving feedback, all that stuff is always appreciated because, of course, we want this thing to grow. All right. Talk to you soon. Peace.